Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everyone. My guest this week is Daniel Levin. Dan is a friend. He is an attorney here in New York. He's a fellow amateur, a Long Island Chess Club regular, and a battle-hardened tournament player. And I'm happy to have him back on. This is Dan's second appearance on the podcast. So, Dan, welcome back. Thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to this because we're going to be reviewing and discussing and analyzing some of your tournament games. And we're going to be looking at two tournaments. I'm not sure how much time we'll have to get to all the games, but we'll get through as much as we reasonably can. So the first tournament was the Eastern Class Championships in Connecticut. You played in the Class A section and also the National Open in Vegas, where you played in the under 1900. And so what I want to do is I really want to get into the games themselves, right? Like I don't need the whole, oh, it was a great experience and I enjoyed meeting new people. We're going to skip that part. I just want to get right to the games and really get into like moves, openings, your thought process, what your opponents were like, and and the whole deal. Just kind of a very practical overview of your games. I think that'll be kind of cool. So why don't you start with your first game? I'll let you take it away, Dan. Okay. In Eastern Class Championship, round uh, one for me, but round two of the tournament because I took a round one bye. Um, I was paired with a man named Christopher Potts, who um, looked like about the, the same age as me. Um, and um, I, I looked him up after afterwards, and I discovered that I had played him before 20 years ago at the same venue um, when we were both rated about 100 points higher and we were both uh, 20 years younger. Uh, I had white. I, I, I played my, my, my usual D4. Uh, we got a D4, D5, uh, a Queen's Gambit, um, exchange variation. Um, on move six, uh, I played uh, Queen C2, which is designed to stop Bishop F5. Um, and uh, Mr. Potts took a big think at that point, which I, I was a bit surprised that he would have a big, big think on move six. I thought perhaps he had prepared Bishop F5 for the for the exchange variation and my Queen C2 move order through him. Talked to him a little bit after the game and he said that that wasn't it. Um, he uh, he was unfamiliar with Queen C2. He knew E3 as being the main line and he was looking for a way to punish it, which of course did not exist. This Queen C2 is a perfectly sound uh, move. Um, we continued down a, a fairly main line until um, I varied um, based on a, on a misconception of what was required in the position. Um, I wanted to make sure to um, trade my dark squared bishop for his dark squared bishop and not for his knight. Um, and in order to make sure that that happened, I, at, when he played knight f8, I retreated the bishop from g5 to h4. Um, to avoid the, the line of uh, h6, bishop h4, knight g6, uh, hitting the bishop again, uh, and it was not really necessary. I, I, I could have uh, I could have just played uh, f3, and then if I re retreat the bishop to h4, if it gets kicked by h6, and if uh, knight g6 happens, f2 would be available for the bishop. So I ended up losing a tempo, um, as I, I did eventually. Um, trade that, that bishop for his bishop on e7. Um, the game um, pr progressed kind of uh, uh, nicely uh, for me. I got the, I got a, a center formation that um, um, was not, not usual for, for that, that opening, but um, seemed, seemed good. Um, I got the, uh, made, a, made a trade on, on, on the 
E E four square, resulting in uh, in in a, in, a, in a black pawn uh, on E four that I could target with Knight G three. Got into um, uh, traded queens, got into an end game, and uh, with uh, so- somewhat uh, weak pawns, I got a, a a bit of an advantage and an initiative. And um, without really doing anything special, um, I got a real, really serious advantage. Um, and I didn't really have to do anything deep; um, just play the natural moves and um, got a got a clearly winning position. And my opponent did something that almost never happens at the club. He resigned in a position where material was equal. Um, pawns were going to fall, um, and it was clear that uh, I was going to get a material advantage. I was a bit surprised that he, he resigned when he resigned, um, despite the fact that I that I really was pretty sure I was winning. And uh, going over the game afterwards, um, at the point he resigned, the computer said plus six for white. Didn't, didn't, we didn't really talk about um, um, the point, uh, the, the, the perhaps early resignation. I didn't really think it was a, it was a really early resignation. Um, okay, but you were surprised. Uh, yes, I was. I was. I was surprised that he didn't didn't at least uh, make make me show some technique. It happens. They they just don't want to play it out. Okay, so that was a nice one. Round two, or, or actually round three of the tournament, second game for me, second game of the day. It was uh, two, two, two games a day, and the time control was pretty slow. It was um, I think it was uh, forty moves in eighty minutes, and then sudden death thirty with a ten second delay. My 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 opponent for I guess I'll call it round three um, was a about a fifteen year old uh, girl named uh, Claire Cheng. Um, according to the cross table, she was rated in, in the high sixteen hundreds. Which um, I, I found surprising because the rating range for the Class A section was 1700 to 1999. Not not sure how um, a person rated under 1700 got into that section, but I think I found out later, uh, which I'll get into um, at the appropriate time. Oh yeah, because I definitely want to hear that because we're still talking about the Eastern Class Championship, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I had um, black naturally after having a white game, you get a black game and, uh, she opened with a D four. I, I played D five and we got a, a Queens gambit position. And, um, before the tournament, I had kind of intended to play the Lasker variation of the Queens gambit declined if it came up, um, with the idea that it's a very solid opening. I'm playing, I'm, I'm playing basically, I'm playing somewhat playing up, um, even though, it's, I'm, in, I'm in the rating range. Uh, my rating is in the low 1700s. The rating range is 1700 to 1999. I'm expecting I'm even playing mostly higher rated players. So at the board against uh, who I thought was a lower rated player, I changed my mind and uh, I went into the Tartakova variation of uh, the Queen's Gambit to get a, a, a more dynamic position, which uh, work, worked out reasonably well. Um, we, did, we did get a, a, a dynamic game. She did point out to me after the game that I played a, a second best move um, in, in, in the opening. When um, there's a trade on d5 without a trade of um, bishop for knight on f6, uh, it's better for black to recapture on d5 with the knight. But I took back with the pawn to get the, the structure that I, uh, uh, that I wanted. It's it's it, it's sound, but it's but it's but it's not best. We ended up with a fairly complicated game. I don't want to get into too much in, in, into the details, but um, uh, the game um, went into an end game with uh, I had an extra pawn, and um, I ended up blundering my extra pawn and offering a draw right after I blundered my extra pawn, which was accepted. Um, when the tournament was raided, my opponent, this uh, uh, young lady actually had an entering rating of about 1860. She had previously played a, uh, uh, t- an amateur team tournament and had a very good result um, and gained um, over 100 points, um, which I think is the explanation for why she was in Class A. Uh, her live rating put her in Class A, even though her published rating did not. All right, so you're doing well so far. Yes, I've uh, got um, one and a half out of two plus a plus a buy, so actually two out of three for the, the tournament scoring, and I get to um, have a night's sleep because uh, I did not stay at the hotel. 
Um, the the uh, I, I, I uh, my brother lives in, in in Hartford. I stayed in my brother's uh, apartment. Save some money. I was going to say that save a lot of money. Yeah, those hotel rates add up. Um, my opponent for uh, round four was uh, another another man about my same the same age as me, uh, which, which I like to see. Uh, okay, so another thirty nine year old. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably over fifty is the by the look. Fifty is the new thirty, Dan. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. I'm feeling pretty pretty energetic. Okay, so go ahead. So you're white, right? Yep. So I, I, I'm white, and um, after I play d4, I got knight f6, and I play the Trompowski, bishop g5. Oh, that's part of your uh, regular bag. You've you've played that against me a number of times. I've been playing. I've been playing the Trompowski um, for about a year now, and I, I like to have having having it as an option. Um, I'm playing it some rather exclusively after d4, knight f6. I um, spoiler alert: I don't plan on playing it exclusively uh, for forever. Uh, D4, Knight of Six, C4 is in is in my repertoire, and I'm going to trot that out as, as as well as the feeling strikes me. I can see that my opponent did not like the fact that I played the Trump House King. He took his time on move two before coming up with with, with E6. Okay, which is normal. Yep, yep, it's um, perfectly sound. Um, I, I played Knight D2 with the idea that um, if he plays H6, I have the the, the option of playing uh, Bishop H4 which is how it went. We got a a, um, a reversed um, Carlsbad pawn structure. Each each side has a has a D pawn, uh, D4, D5, uh, and I had I had the the C pawn, he had the E pawn, and we each have a half open file. Makes for for interesting strategic middle game. He played some passive moves and got a a rather bad bishop. Uh, his light squared bishop really never never got activated. I was able to get some 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 kingside activity. Got a, a a knight on e5, supported it with f f4. The f file uh, eventually opened. Um, he played uh, I had I got to I got the we had a trade a trade of, uh, of of knights on on e5 which put a pawn my uh, I got a white pawn on e5. Um, he played f5. I took en passant. As a, a trade of rooks on, uh, on f6, and because my bishop was in the attack and his bishop wasn't, I was I was basically um, attacking a piece up, queen rook and bishop. He was only defending with queen and rook. He couldn't hold. Um, uh, I, I, I was able to to, to 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 break through with the major pieces and um, force either a checkmate or a win of a, a win of his queen um, before move 30. Again, I I I didn't do anything really special. Um, he, he, he just kind of never figured out a good development for his, for his light squared bishop. Just natural moves led to a winning position. You know what? And that happens so often. Sorry to jump in, Dan, at this level, not all the time, but where your opponent just sort of self-destructs, like they lose the game for themselves. And like you said, you just sort of play regular chess, quote unquote, and, you know, they just sort of hang themselves and then you very easily just march on to victory, like that type of thing happens a lot. So sounds like you're having a great tourney so far, right? That's like what, three very good games. Yes. Um, uh, Two wins with white and uh, and a a draw with black against what turned out to be a higher rated opponent. Although at the time I thought it was a lower rated opponent. And um, so after round four, I have um, three out of four and it turned out that I, I got Paired on the on the on the top board um, because one person had four out of four and no one had three and a half in this section. Um, and I, I I guess I I, I drew the short stick because I, I got paired against the, the hot hand and I have black. And what was his or or her rating? His, his rating was about um, seventeen seventy. Of course, going up because he was four and zero oh, uh, go, going into the into the game. So. It's gonna be eighteen hundred. It's a, a, a teenager, um, late teenager. I, I I would say he was seventeen or eighteen years old. His his look, I can't be one hundred percent sure. That's my guess. The person uh, on the board next to me had played him in the previous round and um, talked to him a bit, and uh, so I, I learned a few things uh, about him that um, he plays very fast. So I'd be prepared for that. I, what I wasn't prepared for is the manner in which he played fast. After I made my move, he would make his response bef- before writing down my move. 
which is not what I'm used to seeing. In a, in a classical time control game, I'm used to seeing I make my move, my opponent records my move, and then thinks about it and makes a reply. Even if he knows exactly what he's going to do, I usually ex- ex- expect an opponent to write the move down, write my move down before making his move. And was he making his move like immediately after yours? Yes. Not always, but if he was prepared to, he did. See, now I'm wondering, is that just his style because he plays a lot of speed chess or is that some kind of technique to annoy you? Because some players do that. I'm not saying that this young man did that, but some players do that. It's kind of a sort of a, what's the, I'm blanking on the word for it, but it's sort of like this rapid fire method of playing where they just try to annoy you by playing so fast as if you're saying, you know, you're not challenging me and you're thinking like, how is it possible that he's making these fast. I mean, what, what was your read on that? Do you think that was his style or do you think he was trying to get into your head? I, I think it was his style or perhaps he wants to get into everybody's head. And that's his, and it's his style because it has an unnerving effect on his opponents. Yeah. And he's four and oh, so it's got to be working. I would imagine. It worked for me. It worked against me. I, 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 I made some, I made some errors that I might not have um, ordinarily made. But before I made some uh, 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 the major errors, he offered a draw in a fairly early position, um, s- still in the opening, and I, I felt somewhat honor bound to refuse. Why do you think he offered the draw? Any guesses? He offered the draw because um, he was a, 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 a point ahead of the field. Um, he had four closest competition at three. If he gets the four and a half, he wins. Okay, so he's trying to sort of not game the system, but he's he's thinking about. Yeah, he's he's thinking of the big picture, not this particular game. Okay, and that, that's that's why I, I I thought I had to refuse to draw. Uh, on the on the personal level, uh, I need to win to to tie for the top. If I was somebody else on three points, I wouldn't want the person who has four points to get a a, a draw without a fight. No, I respect that. Yeah, I thought I should protect the field. The opening was odd. Um, it, was, it went d4, d5, and then knight c3. I'm thinking maybe Jabal Lovin is coming. But after I played knight f6, his third move was not bishop f4, it was f3. I had not seen that before. I'm on move three, and I got a new position. I played e6. Uh, he followed up uh, consistently with e4. And um, I played bishop b4, pinning, pinning the c3 knight. It's got a pawn on f3. He developed his, uh, his kingside knight to h3. And um, I, I missed a, 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 a tactical or strategic combination where I could have won a pawn, but I got fixated on a, on a, on a different plan. So I was like, if a, I get this tunnel vision sometimes where I'm think, I think about um, what, what I want to achieve rather than looking for the opportunities that the position um, is, is giving. Sometimes you're so concerned about winning a pawn, but you know, is it worth it? Like you'll win a pawn, but then it's this very odd position and it's like, oh great, I won a pawn, but at what cost? And if the cost is that you now have a position that's very unfamiliar. So it might've been a better choice strategically to go into the plan that you saw and that you're comfortable with rather than go into a plan you're not sure about to win a pawn. I don't know, maybe not all the time, but you know, sometimes, you know, these are things you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of. It would have been great if I had weighed the pros and cons of it, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't a- aware of the, of the, of the opportunity. I, just, okay. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't um, consider all the candidate moves. I just, I just went for the plan that I had formulated two moves previously, which um, squandered an opportunity. Um, and uh, eventually I lost the game. I got overrun on the on, on the king side by uh, by uh, major pieces, and uh, had to resign on move thirty two. All right, it happens. So, still a decent tournament, plus one, no prize money. If I had accepted the draw, I would have gotten some some small amount of uh, money back. All right, so you played four games total. Is that right? I played four. It was a five game tournament. I took a, a round one by. Uh, the schedule was uh, one round Friday night. Two two rounds, two games, Saturday and Sunday. Um, they offered a two day schedule where you play two games at a faster time control and then merge for the the round three at the at the normal longer time control. But I didn't want to play three games in one day. 
but I thought it better to just take the half point by and play the two games a day on Saturday and Sunday. Anyway, just listening to it, other than that last game, I mean, pretty nice outing for you. Yeah, I was I was uh, certainly pleased with the the, the overall uh, trajectory of that tournament. So now we're going to move on to Vegas, right? Yes. Okay, so I know they say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but we're going to break that rule a little bit because we're going to learn about your games. For the uh, National Open, um, the, the, the time control for National Open was uh, game 90 with a 30-second increment. Okay, now an increment, when they use an increment, an increment is it as in you're gaining time on the clock like when you play online. Yes. Just for our listeners who may not be familiar, a standard delay is just kind of a countdown. But with the increment, you actually get that time back that you're not using. So you start your your, your game with uh, 90 minutes. And um, after the first five moves of the opening, you may have uh, 92 minutes. Um, so uh, first round, I was paired with um, a, a, um, a young woman, um, I'd say maybe maybe 16 years old. Um, rated in about fifteen fifty. Okay, and just to remind everybody, you're now playing in the under nineteen hundred section, correct? Correct. Which 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 means that my entering rating was 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 um, was, was above the midpoint of uh, so, uh, like because I, I got paired down in round one. So a lot of people a lot of people play uh, play up. Well, yeah. For you know what, it's funny. Let's talk about playing up for a major event like that. I'm not really a weekend guy, but if I did, I would actually play up because presumably every game, you know, you're going to have a decent pairing. Like, so if you lose, let's say round one, instead of like, oh, I'm now going to be pared down because you're playing up, you'll still get a decent pairing, presumably for round two. And all your games will be instructional. I mean, there's playing up and there's playing up. I wouldn't. You know, if, if you're a 1600 player, I wouldn't play in the open section. But you know, if you're a 1600 player and you're playing in, let's say, the under 19 or under 2000, you know, that might be something to consider. I had black in the first game, and uh, she opened d4. I played d5. She played c4. I played e6. Knight c3. Knight f6. And knight f3. So a fairly standard Queen's Gambit position. Knight F3 is rather flexible. You know, Bishop G5 was an option. Um, I kind of wanted to see Bishop G5, so I anticipated it and played Bishop E7 and was somewhat surprised to, to have E3 as the response. I thought a fairly passive way for, for White to play. I castle, she played Bishop D3, and um, I played at that point, Take the pawn on c4. If the bishop's going to recapture it, the bishop's already moved. And after the bishop recaptured, I uh, broke in the center with uh, c5. We, we got a game. Uh, game on. I, I don't want to get too much more detail about just the, the exact moves. So I'm going to kind of just describe a, a, a bit of, of, of what, what happened. I got, a, I got a chance to expand on the queen side using some, some, some tactics, um, not winning any material. But I got in um, b5 and c4 pawn pushes. And uh, with the c4 pawn push in, the square d3 became available as a target outpost for a knight, which I got there. I got a knight on d3 supported by, by c4, uh, putting a, a nice cramp on her position. I thought I had a fairly serious advantage. But I was taking time. I got myself into some some time... Not exactly time trouble, but I was aware of the clock. I was trying to, uh, to, to, to speed up, avoid getting into real time trouble. But the negatives of being in time trouble, I was experiencing anyway, not thinking deeply. And um, I let the advantage slip. And in a position that was getting uh, uh, more equalish with her getting some, some, some counterplay, I made a, 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 a blunder that... Um, I, I, I make um, with a, a alarming frequency. I interfered with my own defense. I, 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 I retreated a piece that cut off a very important line of protection in my camp. Um, basically, I, I, I moved I moved a knight backwards 
that uh, interfered with, um, I think it was um, my queen's uh, the defense of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a forking square. It might have been a bishop's defense of a forking square. The outcome of the game is um, I allowed a fork uh, on a square that um, would have been defended uh, before I made my, my final move. Um, turning a, 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 a position a game that um, I, I think I was at some point, um, if, if not winning, something like um, 1.5 ahead um, by stockfish analysis into a clear loss, which I found very upsetting. You know, and, uh, uh, not, not, not the way I wanted to start the, the, uh, a major event that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, we, we've all been there. I mean, I'm sure everybody listening to this is like, yep. I've done that more times than I want to remember. So when you made that blunder, when you retreated that night there, you had, a, I mean, am I correct that you had, I guess, a positional or a strategic idea in mind and you just lost sight of the tactical drawbacks of it? Well, uh, at that point, I, I, I was defending against an initiative and um, I needed to make a concession. And um, I, um, the the night retreat that I that, that I made was was an attempt to um, hold everything without making a concession. Um, but the tactics of the position required a concession. Um, there was there was a a, a different uh, retreating move that did hold everything together. The night move that I made had an had in, in, was intending a reroute that would have would have uh, tried to rest the initiative back. I was I was trying to do uh, more than the position really allowed. Yeah. Now, was it the kind of thing, did you see the fork before she played it? Like, did you move it and like 10 seconds later, uh-oh, or did did you not see it until she played it? Um, it was uh, the former. Um, I, I knew it was coming. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm just saying it's like, because I'm, I, I go through that too. It's the worst. Like you make the move and you're like, oh, and then you start, and this is like the worst place to be. Oh, maybe they won't see it. And as soon as you're thinking, maybe they won't see it, you know, you're in trouble. It happens. It happens. I did something similar a week or two ago where I was thinking, because this is one of my biggest mistakes is I'll be focused on something so positionally, I don't check the tactics enough or I do it superficially or I get lazy or I'm tired. And it's kind of what you went through it. And and the response, like the the fact that it's a mistake, like the, the winning move to take advantage of the mistake it's really not that hard to see. Yeah, that's 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 uh, the life of the amateur chess player. Stronger players go through this. I mean, on a, on a different level, but you know, even even title players will express something similar. But that's how it goes. But anyway, so um, I got over my my uh, being upset to, uh, about that game. Um, got a decent night's sleep. Got a good breakfast, and uh, was ready for round two, where I had the white pieces. And I was paired with uh, a player rated uh, in the 1600s, um, uh, uh, a, young, a young man, um, pro- probably late teens, 16, 17. And uh, so I, had, I have white, um, played my usual D4. It's got a, a D4, E6, C4, D5, um, Knight C3, Knight F6. And I played my the exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit, which is what I've been playing recently and you know, stick with it for a while. Uh, it's another way to get the Carlsbad pawn structure. You get the Carlsbad pawn structure and then Queen's Gambit declined exchange variation when black plays pawn to C6. My opponent played Knight C6, which uh, I don't think is a good move um, in the Queen's Gambit exchange. And uh, he followed it up immediately with uh, Knight to B4 hitting my queen on c2, which then moved the bishop to b3. And then he played bishop f5, which targets the c2 square, threatens a, a, a fork, uh, which I have to defend with rook, rook c1. And um, he shocked me by coming into c2 anyway. I've got c2 defended by the queen and the rook. He's, he, he puts uh, his, his bishop on, on the square. I take twice on C2 and I get two pieces for a rook. That's advantageous. Absolutely. Uh, I'm happy, but I'm surprised. I, I, I built a, a, a fairly clear winning advantage from from that uh, head start that he gave me. 
Um, it was a, a point in the, in, in, in the game where um, he um, uh, uh, attacked a, a minor piece, and I saw that um, uh, that if I uh, that I don't have to retreat it, I could I could uh, do 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 a counter attack and um, get some simplification, which I went for. Um, but there was a point of the game where um, I, I I I lost that mindset of um, looking for the attack. I, I don't remember what the material balance was at, at, exactly at that point, but he was attacking uh, on the king side, and I was looking for defense. I found a defense in the queen trade, but it had to give away a pawn. Yeah, the material balance at that point was um, I had a, I had a, um, I, I, I had parlayed the um, two pieces for a rook into a, 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 a piece for a pawn, but I was facing that that king side attack. And found a defense where I get the get the queens off uh, at the cost of a pawn, um, so being up a piece for two pawns, uh, and and a, a rook knight and four pawns versus rook and six pawns, which was not that simple. If I had looked for counterattack rather than defense, Stockfish tells me I had an attacking move that was going to put me up plus six, so I made it much harder on myself than than than, uh, than was than was required. But I did find uh, a way to win the um, rook knight and four pawns versus rook and six pawns in game. So back to even. So that's two games so far for the National Open. Uh, so game three is l- later that same day. Um, paired with another player uh, who's lower rated than me. In the, I didn't write down the rating, but I think it was, a, it was in the 1500s. And um, I had black. Um, after e4, I played the Karo Khan. Uh, and my opponent played the so-called fantasy variation, 3f3. I play e6 against that, kind of a French structure, make, make, the, make the triangle, kind of, in, it kind of inviting e5, but he didn't play e5. He played um, bishop d3. Eventually, um, in, in, in the opening, I got an opportunity to um, win a pawn. Um, but the pawn was the B pawn, and the piece that, that uh, captures it was the like, queen. It's uh, a well-known fact that taking the, the, the B pawn with the queen is dangerous. And I did have to suffer an initiative. You're grabbing hot pawns now, Dan. Yep, I grabbed the hot pawn. <laughs> and um, the, the, the course of the game was um, uh, the, the, the attempts to consolidate which I uh, oh, oh, pretty much did, beating b- back the, the attack. But I, um, I, I did kind of falter a little bit at, at the end. Um, I missed the fact that my opponent could play his knight from g6 to h8 and give a check. I, over, I literally overlooked that move and did not consider that, that candidate move, which is a cardinal sin. You should always look at every check. And the result of that knight h8 check move was a perpetual. Had I seen the possibility of the knight h8 check, I could have played a different move before that that would have given me other options than, than taking the perpetual in a position where um, I, I was a pawn up and, 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 and surviving against the attack. So it, it was, it was a, probably a half-point mistake in, in, in not, not seeing that... Uh, the knight h8 check was going was was uh, going to force the perpetual, so a draw in game in round three, a fighting draw. Not not too bad. Could have been worse. So I was feeling I was feeling okay, um, even score, and I get white for um, the, the the first game of the next day for round four, playing against a um, a man who looked like he was probably in his late twenties. So a kid. Kid to you and me, but uh, <laughs> but not 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 a not a not a real kid. Yeah, and I got to I got to play the Trumpowski for the first time in Las Vegas. My opponent responded with uh, Knight E4. Um, I had been playing the Raptor variation, but I didn't. I, I, for for this tournament, I, I decided that the that, that there was too much too much to memorize and and and, and learn in the Raptor. So I played the more calm retreat of Bishop to F4. And again, I got a, a fairly shocking reply from my opponent. He went back to knight f6. So let me give you, give you the, the first three moves. d4, knight f6, bishop g5, 
knight e4, hits my bishop, bishop f4, knight back to f6. That's a pretty serious loss of tempo. But I mean, it's probably not going to hurt him that much. I think you're right. It didn't really hurt him that much because. Um, no, I, I mean, it's I, not. It's not like a double question mark. No, it's it's it's, it's question mark exclam. I think dubious. I, I think it is bad. It's just not terrible. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. It's not like it's not like awful, but it's it's not great either. But it's not. He's not losing the game or anything. No, not losing the game. So I went c4. And he went d5. Uh, e3. Bishop f5. Knight c3, c6. And the position now looks like a Slav. In a certain sense, it looks a little bit like a, um, it could also look like a, a reverse London. I was fairly familiar with the, that, that, that structure and some of the possible plans. I played queen b3, which hits the b pawn and puts pressure on, on, on d5. Uh, he played queen b6. The queens are looking at each other. Uh, I pushed forward c5. He, he, Trades queens on, on, on b3, queen b3, a b3. Uh, so uh, I've got a double pawn, but I've got an open a file. I was going to say, it sounds like a London type of sequence, but you, you, got, you got the better end of it because you want the, you're better off with those double pawns and the, the open a file, and then you could push your b pawn. I think um, I played some, some inaccuracies, and he got, he got uh, I, I think he equalized. Um, the, the, the position with uh, with some counterplay in the center, but he made a mistake by breaking the, the tension in the center by by, um, by by pushing forward. He had played um, um, e5, um, creating pawn tension, um, but he but, but he, he broke the tension by playing e4. And once he broke that 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 tension, uh, my my queenside initiative or my queenside space advantage became the factor in the position. He kind of he kind of um, Killed his own counterplay by locking the center. I was able to um, create a pass pawn on the queen side and advance it and trade off rooks on the A file, and he couldn't handle the pass pawn. So it was another another fairly easy win uh, because my opponent made it easier for me than he, than, he, than he really had to. Yeah, and mishandling the pawn tension in the center, those sort of overextending or you know, knowing when to push, knowing when to take. That that's very common. A lot of times that happens. I think if players don't have an idea, or if, if they just don't analyze well enough, but all it takes is one inaccurate pawn move like that, and the game completely turns. Yeah, he did. He did make a, a blunder later, uh, a, a, you know, ta- tactical blunder where where he, he uh, uh, lost a pawn um, by cap- capturing with the wrong piece. Um, but his game was already uh, already under pressure at that point. Um, but that, that made it easier. Um, when, when you're, when you're a pawn up and have a pass pawn, it's very, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. So that's four games. Now, how many games did you play in Vegas total? Seven. Seven. Okay. You know what? I think, I think we may be able to get through the whole thing because we're four. This, so this is now going to be game five. So lay it on me. All right. Game five. Um, um, another, another, uh, man who's, um, closer to my age than a teenager, um, I, I think he was probably in his forties and his rating was, was good. He was rated in the, in the, um, upper 1800s. And I had black and got exactly the same opening, um, as, uh, uh, game one, which surprised me yeah, that five E three move in the Queens gambit where, where white's first five moves are D four, C four, knight C three, knight F three, then E three locking in the, uh, the Bishop. So not only do I think it's uh, not the most challenging uh, opening to face, I was prepared for it because I went over my, my game from game one. Um, I, I, I knew what to do, and I got a, 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 very, uh, a very good game, but not a very dynamic game. Cut, I'll cut, cut to the chase. Um, I, I felt like I had the initiative um, um, throughout the game, but pieces were coming off. Um, and I offered a draw in a position at, the, at move 30 where um, – I thought um, I had let an advantage slip to complete equality, and uh, he accepted it. And that was uh, that, that was the, uh, the the third day. All right, so that's six games, and um, I've got uh, two, uh, two wins, one loss, two draw. That I'm sorry, that was game five. Um, I'm ahead one. So now we're going to talk about game six. Yep, game six. Uh, the following day, um, I've got white 
against a player rated about 1850. Another um, maybe 30-something man, definitely uh, uh, mature, looks like an experienced player. I play D4, he plays F5, and uh, so I got a choice on move on move two. Sometimes I've played the Staunton Gambit against the Dutch. I didn't want to play the Staunton Gambit against the Class A player at the, in, in the, at the National Open, though. So I played G3, and he went for the, the Leningrad variation, Knight F6 and G6 and Fionn Kettowing the Bishop. It's kind of like a King's Indian with F5 already in. What I remembered about the Leningrad Dutch is that um, white can play D5 so that if black ever plays E5, white can capture en passant and not have a E5, F5 pawn duo staring at you. But I think I played D5 too early. I played it on move seven. And um, he did the maneuver uh, knight A6 to C5 which is a good square for the knight after I've got um, after I've already pushed d5. So I think I got I got I got into some trouble in, in, in the opening. I was I was on the back foot. I was the, I was I was defending, which is not what you want to be doing with white. I need to sh- to, to sharpen up what I'm going to do against the Leningrad Dutch. It's uh, a little too too vague on uh, on, on uh, my my preparation there. I put up a a, a decent defense though and uh, Got to a to to an end game position where he, he had uh, penetrated with uh, uh, his, his rook uh, to the seventh rank, second rank in algebraic uh, notation when uh, he's black and I'm white. And I found I, I found a, a, a resource. Um, he had uh, put his, uh, his 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 knight on uh, on the on the rim. I think it was on h five, defended by a, a g four pawn. Uh, I got in um, a, a an F5 push, which potentially destabilized the knight. And um, if he doesn't capture, I can get a protected pass pawn by pushing F6, which is what happened. In the meantime, he's winning a pawn on my queen side with his, his, his roving rook, making a very, very tense position where I've got a protected pass pawn on the king side, but he's got an extra pawn on the queen side. Turned out um, when I went over the game uh, with, the, with the computer with Stockfish, F5 was a, was was the right move but F but F6 was the wrong idea. Instead of pushing F6 and making the protected pass pawn, I should have captured on G6 to open another file and then I would be able to get my rook to his 7th rank, creating a a, a a a more dynamic balance. After the game it it occurred to me that when I had played F5, that would have been an ideal time for me to offer a draw. We were both in time pressure. We we're both down to about 5 minutes. The position had just become much more complicated than it had been before I pushed F5. It was a three-result position. I think if I if I had offered a draw, I think he would have accepted it. Those messy positions and end games and, and, and time pressure, even if he wasn't um, accepted it immediately, I would have given him something more to think about with his clock ticking. I'm kind of kicking myself for not offering the draw. But it didn't occur to me to offer a draw. I was I was very much in the moment, and I thought that I might have something with that protected pass pawn, but I didn't, and I was not able to to to, to make anything of that protected pass pawn. Couldn't advance it. He was able to blockade it, and uh, he had an extra pawn on the queen side, and so he won. And it was a four hour game. No, that's tough. That's a tough loss. Even if you had offered the draw, you, you still don't know that he would have taken. I mean, but like you said. When it's it's a complicated position and you're both in time pressure, that is like primo time to offer if you you know if you want to shake hands and get half the point. But you don't know what he would have done. But you know shoulda woulda coulda. But those yeah those types of of rook pawn end game you know like counterplay types you know th- they're tricky. Since it was a four hour game, I had a, a, an hour and a half before the, the last round. I uh, I was uh, I get 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 some food, so I was. Um, a little bit vulnerable, I think, for the for the final round, and I got paired with a, another another um, young girl, uh, rating in the fifteen hundreds, and and this time a really young girl, small child, um, I, I think eight years old. I didn't ask. Um, I'm just guessing by the size of the child. I was black. Uh, she played e four. I played the Karo Khan. Um, we got a, an exchange variation, and she played an early h three. And when, when white plays an early h3 in the exchange variation, that makes it somewhat tricky for black to develop the light-squared bishop. As, um, white already has a bishop on d3, so uh, f5 is not available, and h3 takes away the g4 square. But I was somewhat prepared for that. Um, the, the, uh, the, 
the line is to play g6, not with the idea of fianchettoing the dark squared bishop, but with the idea of protecting the f5 square for the light squared bishop. So, uh, so that that's how the game went. I played uh, g6 and bishop f5, and she did not take it. If you if you take the bishop at nf5, take back with the g pawn. Um, got double pawns on the king side, but she got a very um, nice, well protected square for uh, uh, on e4 for the uh, for the f6 knight to jump to. I probably should have traded the bishop, but I didn't want to give her the the free queen development. So what I did is I played queen b6. My idea on playing queen b6 was that um, if she took takes the bishop uh, on the next move, I could grab the pawn on b2. She hasn't moved the b1 knight, so the a1 rook hangs. My thinking was she would then move the knight, and then I would take uh, recapture the bishop. But she didn't move the knight. She retreated the bishop, letting me take the rook on a1. And then she play, played queen b3. And now my queen has a hard time getting back into the game. So I'm up an exchange upon an exchange, but my queen is kind of trapped. After I went into that line, it occurred to me that this was not the line to go into against an eight-year-old girl rated 1,500. Eight-year-old girls rated 1,500 are probably tactically very sharp, and I should not have sharpened the position. I really should have exchanged the, those light-squared bishops, even though it gave her a, an extra development move and, and, and played a, a, a normal strategic position. Yeah, that's what I try to do against kids. You know, a- anyone basically like under the age of 15, I try to keep it as boring and as simplistic and as strategic as possible. Because like you said, if you go into like messy tactics and uh, puzzle rush type of position or anything, those wild open tactical positions, that's, you know, they excel at that. Whereas if they really have to think and it's more dry and boring, they sometimes go wrong. My queen spent the rest of that game sitting on A1. While my queen was sitting on A1, I was being attacked. Had to give back the exchange and give back the pawn, get it. So got, got equal material, except my queen is still sitting on a1. And with my queen sitting on a1 and her queen in the attack, uh, I got mated. So I lost both my games on the last day at the at the national open. All right, what are you going to do? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop taking the b pawn with my queen in the Karakhan. Leave that for uh, Yasser Sirawan. <laughs> yeah, right. I do want to say a few, uh, something about the atmosphere at the national open. Um, it is an electric atmosphere. It's 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 um, chess player heaven. When I when I got there the first day uh, to try to check out the 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 the, uh, the the layout, walked into this uh, rotunda area where there was two simultaneous exhibitions going on. Ben Feingold and Eric Rosen were both giving a simultaneous exhibition in the same area, uh, so it was a, a simultaneous simul, if you will. Um, and that sort of set the set the the, the, the flavor for what's what what's gonna what was gonna gonna happen uh, for the, the rest of the weekend. Um, you know, chess, chess is in the air. Um, there's this great bookstore uh, on site. I, I, I bought a pair of, of chess socks, green socks, with chess pieces on them. I'll, I'll wear them to the club one of these days and show you. I also bought a book on the Karakana. Need to sharpen up some of my lines there. If anyone has the wherewithal. And I know most people probably don't. T- making the trip to Las Vegas for the National Open in June is something that um, will leave good memories, um, even if you don't have a great result like I didn't have um, this year. I have to do it one time. I'm definitely going to do it at some point. I went to Vegas once many years ago, n- not to play chess. And great time, great town. So I guess this year I had to live vicariously through you, Dan. I'll get there at some point. One last little anecdote. Um, after I lost my, my, my game um, to the eight-year-old girl um, fairly quickly, um, I went over to um, watch the top boards. Um, and the top board was uh, Hans Neiman. Actually, it was board, board two, but uh, board one had already uh, finished with a quick draw in the last round. So uh, I made I made con- eye contact with, with Hans Neiman while he was uh, playing his last round game. I was trying to give him good vibes. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Hans Neiman. I'm a Hans Neiman supporter. No, that must have been cool. There was probably a big crowd around it. I'm assuming, right? Well, they had they had a um, the the top boards were were kind of on a stage set off. Um, they were roped off, and uh, it was a demonstration board um, and chairs uh, were were set out so that people could could uh, sit down and look at the demonstration board, try to analyze the position, relax a little bit. 
Yeah, uh, I'm probably doing it again next year. Um, although, uh, because of uh, my, my bowling tournament that I do at the same time, um, I may be forced to uh, play one of the accelerated schedules. So you're going to play an accelerated schedule so that you can go bowling? Yes. The bowling tournament is also the uh, big event in Las Vegas. It's, uh, it's, uh, That's cool. You're a man of many talents. Yeah, or uh, or an ill-spent youth. No, no, it's good. Listen, you know, you, you got to stay active. You got to do things. Yeah, if all the time I put into bowling, I had put into chess, I would probably be a national master. I didn't, I didn't know that about you. That's very cool. So if you go next year, we'll definitely have you back on, you know, to go over your games again, if that's cool. Sure. Uh, I have no problem uh, sharing, honestly, uh, both the ups and the downs. Yeah, no, and I, I like these kind of episodes because we're actually talking about the games themselves and like just, you know, practical things that happen in the whole tournament scene so dan really appreciate you coming on great episode really enjoyed listening to your story about your games i'll see you at the club for those of you at home as always we appreciate you listening and i hope you win your next game have a great day